they noticed a brown fabric sticking out of the concrete, pulled on it, and a skull popped up. Every homicide detective that retires always wonders what's going to happen to their unsolved cases. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, the torch has been carried by such excellent detectives. All the investigative work from 2003 to 2017 was all trying to identify the victim. It would have taken somebody with knowledge of the building or some sort of background in construction or demolition and time to encase somebody, especially a body, in that much cement. My name is Detective Ryan Glass. I'm a detective with the NYPD Cold Case Squad, and I'm the lead investigator in the Midtown Jane Doe 2003 Cold Case Homicide. So this case was very unique in the sense that it was a, a case having to do with unidentified human remains. All the investigative work from 2003 to 2017 was all trying to identify the victim because with any homicide, the most important thing is to have a victim, uh, a victim's name to, as a starting point. And for this investigation, we just didn't have that. So upon receiving the case file, it was, it was, there was a lot of tremendous and extensive work done. Uh, Detective Gardner, when he picked it up in 2003, responded to the crime scene. I'm um, retired Detective Gerard Gardner. I was the catching detective for the Midtown Jane Doe homicide case back in 2003. Uh, I remember I was uh, working a night tour that night, 4 p.m. to 1 a.m. tour. I was running late. I was stuck in traffic. I get a phone call from one of my colleagues saying there was a skeleton found in the basement of 301 West 46th Street. The building that was there at the time was a uh, five-story tenement. It was a dilapidated building. There were only a handful of tenants remaining in that building. A restaurant, which faced 8th Avenue, had apparently made some sort of agreement with the owner of the dilapidated building to rent out a portion of their basement. So they hired some construction workers to clear out debris in the basement. They discovered a concrete platform in the north uh, easternmost corner of the basement. And one of the things that construction workers had told me was that uh, the concrete platform appeared out of place. It appeared to be relatively new in comparison to the rest of the basement. Uh, so when they struck it uh, with a hammer, um, they were surprised to find out that it was hollow. They noticed a uh, brown fabric sticking out of the concrete, pulled on it, and a skull popped up. It certainly wasn't the conventional homicide that I was used to dealing with. Uh, the homicides I've dealt with are, are pretty much, uh, for lack of a better term, fresh. Um, these are the toughest cases because oftentimes you have very little to, to work on. Um, if you don't know who the victim is, um, can't immediately determine, or it's extremely difficult to determine when they were killed. You rely heavily on trace evidence. The anthropologist collected the bones after we were able to access um, the skeleton uh, and remove the trace evidence that we found. The most notable items were an extension cord, pantyhose, and some glittery pieces of fabric, uh, in addition to a 1969 dime, a bowl of a watch. Uh, those items and the ultimately the uh, ring on the uh, victim's uh, right pinky. Based on the positioning of the bones, I'm, I was informed by the forensic anth anthropologist Amy Mundorf that the victim was uh, hogtied uh, with uh, the pantyhose and the uh, extension cord that was recovered amongst her remains. Every homicide detective that retires always wonders what's going to happen to their unsolved cases. and. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, the torch has been carried by such excellent detectives such as Bobby Hahn and Ryan Glass. So all the investigative work that was done prior to me with Detective Gardner and Detective Robert Hahn from Manhattan South Homicide, uh, I picked up the ball uh, from that and was waiting on some of the evidence from the crime scene and from her remains to be tested. Uh, we used an outside lab for that sort of testing and a lot of the evidence pertaining to her remains were very degraded. So it wasn't for a lack of trying or investigative work, but we were able to finally get a, a sample that was suitable enough for our genealogist and our, our police lab at the Forensic Investigation Division to upload it into, our, into the, the gene genealogy websites. I'm Detective Joe Rodriguez. I'm Linda Doyle. I'm a genealogist at the NYPD. So we got our genetic match list back from GEDmatch, and we had a first cousin, which is gold. You don't generally have that happen. Um, so we started with him, and his surname was McLone. So we knew that this was, uh, I guess this is a good, very good clue, yes. considering that the ring that was found with the remains was a PMCG. 
Um, yeah, so we know we're off to a pretty good start. Yeah, so again, this is a first cousin. So first cousins um, share grandparents. So we found out his grand or his father. So this is Mr. McGlone. And then his father is... And then from there, um, this is also kind of shocking. Um, he was born in New York, his father was born in New York, and his father only had three siblings. So we know that our Jane Doe is going to be a descendant of one of these siblings. So we have Bernard McGlone, oops, and we know that we have a sister, we'll just call her H. McGlone. And then we go from here and we want to look at their children. Yep. Based on the DNA evidence, it could only be the biological child of Bernard McGlone and Patricia Gilligan. They had one child, which is Patricia McGlone, and that was what we were starting with. So we needed to get um, what was her last proof of life. So now that, now that she's been identified and we could put a name to, to, to this case, uh, she's no longer identified as Midtown Jane Doe. Her name is Patricia Kathleen McGlone. She was born April 20th, 1953 in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. And, uh, our last proof of life for her that we have is the spring of 1969, based on her school record. Uh, there's some indication that she uh, may have been pregnant at the time for the reason of her leaving school. And there's also evidence that we have uh, through a marriage affidavit and certificate that she had been married, which also lends itself as to why she would have left school in May of 1969. So our next leg in the investigation is to figure out uh, the people closest to her at that time which would have been her husband that she met, was married to, who was significantly older than her, given what we have. And we're trying to establish what type of relationship or situation they may have been in. She was never reported missing from my investigation or the records that I have on her. But prior to uh, getting knowledge that she had gotten married in 1969, we were able to track down an interview that was done with her mother from an unrelated investigation in Northern New Jersey having to do with a half-brother that we identified. The half-brother was involved in some embezzlement and check fraud for a company he used to work for. And that company sent investigators out to Brooklyn to speak with his stepmother, which would have been Jane Doe's mom. And from that interview, Jane Doe's mom, who was also named as Patricia, was able to give us a very short but detailed uh, statement uh, to those investigators that I have access to and I've read that lends itself to that she has not been seen in some months. And that interview was conducted in May of 1970. This investigation has led me all over the country, all over New York City. Uh, the investigation also led me up to Dannemora Correctional Facility, where I had the opportunity to speak to Joel Rifkin, the serial killer. Joel Rifkin was initially in 2003, from news articles, was looked at very briefly as potentially committing this homicide. Again, we did not have a name for her or what have you, but in speaking with him, I was told that given the amount of cement that she was found in, that it would have taken somebody with knowledge of the building or some sort of background in construction or demolition and time to encase somebody, especially a body, in that much cement. So first and foremost, we want to get information on, on who did this to her. We want to, we want to find out who killed her, given the way she was found. It was a horrific way to be killed uh, or for any child to, to end up. Uh, we want to establish uh, any sort of connections that anybody can tell us based on her past and history that we know that could shed some light on, on where, she, where she came from or where she ended up to end up in this position. We would like to talk to anybody that was a, uh, a neighbor of hers. She grew up on 52nd Street, 375 52nd Street in Brooklyn, New York. We want to talk to any other neighbors that I may have not spoken to. We want to speak to anybody that may have worked or frequented the nightclub in the basement where she was found. That nightclub was called Steve Paul's The Scene. It was open from 1963 to, to late 1969. We would like to speak to anybody that worked there or anybody, any girls or kids <clears throat> that frequented that club back then uh, or have any knowledge of, of what type of environment, atmosphere, and the demographic of people that may have hung out there. Uh, myself, with that information that I had, I've done a lot of investigative work and interviews with people like that, a lot of employees, prior neighbors, old schoolmates. Uh, we're just trying to just spread the web further to see, you know, who could give us information that we don't have already. From the Cold Case Squad, if you have any information pertaining to this Midtown Jane Doe homicide, if you have any information on Patricia Kathleen McGlone from Sunset Park, Brooklyn in the 1960s, I ask you to please call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-577-TIPS.